Hello. Lovely to see you. Be out here in the world. You can still hear crickets. I stop. Can you hear them? I love that sound. It's just really nice. Makes me stop, makes me slow down. And it was a very beautiful sunny morning when I got up and took the little video at the top of the hill. But now the weather's changed. I'll show you the weather. Can't really see, but the clouds are drifting from left, which is south, to right. And so that means it's gotten cool and it's clouded over. And I'm going to show you some flowers before we go inside and talk about what I've been writing for God and me today. So this is called Lotus Lake. It's a salmon-coloured pelagonium, and I really like it. This flower's a little bit fresher. It's just so bright, and I love the shape of the petals. And we're doing this, by the way, in case you're thinking, why is she rabbiting on about this instead of what the live is about? You know, because I write the description. Um, because it always takes a little time. This is a Facebook Live, and this is a fuchsia with an orange centre. Um, it always takes time for the live to actually tune up on my profile and for my husband to find it and share it out to the groups. And so um, I always take a little time to appreciate my garden, unless it's raining outside, in which case I go inside and show you some rocks, because I have crystals. And I'm really enjoying this fuchsia plant. It, it's just lovely. And look down here, we've got a bright, um, right now it's a chamomile, golden fever few, um, plant growing down here, because they do. you know. And look at the fallen blossoms against... This ground cover, which I think is called Mercury Bay, I don't know, it's a bit violent really, it kills things, but it's just beautiful. All the same, it really does stop the weeds. And look, the roses, that big tall spike is sort of finished, and there's a few left. <sighs> Hello beautiful being, it is good to see you live. Just doing the little tour of the garden, gets you some nice fresh fuchsia flowers and look you can see there are fuchsia fruits as well apparently you can make jam with these oh, and they fall off real fast um, but I don't want to make jam <laughs> just enjoy the flowers and the way they dangle um, and what else did I want to show you I've just noticed look at this I mean this is just clover right isn't it glorious how often do we stop and appreciate the beauty of plain ordinary clover i love this i'm just really noticing it right now and look we've got some um cinerarias these are huge leaves they're bigger than my hand just coming up they'll be full of color flowers um, in a few months when it's spring right now it's autumn um, and so everything is shutting down you can see that the uh the granny's bonnet it's going mouldy, you know, it does that, it's got to die down, and there's all kinds of things here that need attention, you know, there are weeds because I've cleared ground, um, but that's all part of life in a garden, look at this monster, it's now fighting with the cherry, and I need to prune it, I just need an opportunity to do that, um, and this enormous magnolia, which used to be, when it was planted 20 or 30 years ago, it was sort of about this big, you know, it started being this size, at about a metre or three feet from the ground. And now it's this big tree that is definitely taller than I am. Um, and then there's the other magnolia up there. So, you know, the garden just carries on doing its thing. And I'm noticing we have just a single red clover. I don't know why they say it's red, because really this is pink. Just enjoying some of the lawn flowers. There you go, now you've got some focus. Before we go inside, and I talk about what I've been doing today, there is always something to see, even when, you know, apparently there's nothing going on. This is a, I really like this violet. In spring and for a good chunk of the summer, it's just covered in white flowers and they smell glorious. But I also, and you can see why. Beautiful golden calendula because I so enjoy these they're so bright um, just so you can see the color all right and now I'm gonna go inside 
and tell you what I've been doing this week for God of me. It's been actually a pretty um, productive week. My husband's done some um, tracings of the human brain. I mean, I found pictures, but I, I traced him, and he's traced them, and he's coloured them um, to make the various parts of the brain that I want to illustrate easier to see. And if you go to the God of Me page, you can see the first of those. I've got some others, but um, I need to put labels on them and explain them, because the whole point of this is to make it easy to understand. And I haven't done that part yet, so... And it's something I hope to do towards the end of the week when I have time to do it. Right now, what I'm talking about is what I've written today. Um, and last week, I, I started talking, well, the week before last week, I started talking about the fact that we have inherited memories. We have, we have memories. Like when a baby is born, there are still all kinds of things it knows how to do. It knows, you know, it looks towards light or sound. Um, I don't think it looks towards light, but it, it will turn its head toward a loud sound. And there are certain reflexes that they have. There are just things that babies know how to do, besides the fact that the baby's body actually runs. You know, you've got to have some memory somewhere that's doing all of that. So where do we get those from? And that's what started me off on this next big piece, really, which is to explain how we get our operating system. Like you have a blank computer, you turn it on, nothing happens. You've got to load up an operating system. So what is the operating system? Because if we want to change how we feel, then, I mean, we think a thought, we feel a feeling, we, and sometimes we feel a feeling, and then we think a thought. It can go in both ways. But the problem, that the thing that stops so many of us from changing ourselves and creating something different in our life is the fact that we only are aware of 5% of who we are and the other 95% of who we are we're not aware of and we don't understand and it's not even I mean to me because I looked it up you know what's the difference between subconscious and unconscious and there is a difference so your conscious mind you know you're 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 listening to me with your conscious mind you are interacting you're you're observing whatever it is you're doing you're aware right and then the subconscious mind, one definition that I looked up, said that the subconscious is stuff that you can be reminded about. You know, it's, oh, yeah, I remember that, and I remember that. It's stuff that you can still bring it to your awareness, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's under the surface. But you can remember it. And then there are completely unconscious things, like the fact that, you know, there's this amazing system, it's called your autonomic nervous system, that runs your body. It's incredible what it does in every single second just to keep you alive. You have no awareness of that. Um, you can't control the billions and trillions of, of chemical reactions that are going on in your cells at every second. You can't do that. This is way too big. The unconscious self, right? And you think, what's the chemistry that's running my cells got to do with the unconscious self? Well, remember, the chemistry of our cells, cells have got receptors and the chemicals that we make because we have a thought and have a feeling and the feeling makes chemicals that goes into our body. Hi, Mike. Um, those chemicals hit the receptors on our cells and communicate with the factory part of the cell, which is the DNA, and the cell puts out proteins and the proteins make our body run. They keep it alive. They keep it going. And so those chemicals, and I've slightly lost my thought here, those chemicals... That they train our cells to be a certain way, so we have chemical memories. Um, and, and they can even affect whether our genes work properly or not. We can have genes that are there and they're not awake. They're not working. They're not active. Um, and we can have genes that are awake and then they go to sleep. And you think, well, how does that happen? We change them because of how we think and feel and think and feel and think and feel and think and feel for decades and decades and decades, you know. That's what actually happens. And when our cells change, and a few weeks, maybe a month or two ago, I was talking a lot about this, about the fact that our cells upregulate genetic expression and they downregulate genetic expression depending on what chemicals are hitting them all the time. And remember, those chemicals are hitting them all the time because we're thinking the same thoughts and feeling the same feelings, and so we hit ourselves with the same chemicals. And, you know, the receptors get tired or um, they, conversely, they can get really bored 
um, and, and the cell will change to adapt to whatever is most commonly happening in our body. That is a chemical memory. And we're not conscious of it. It's happening autonomically, automatically. We have this amazing nervous system. You know, the, you know, the, the three brains. We're only talking about the pictures that my husband's been doing of the brains. And you, if you go to God of Me page, you'll see the first one of these. And it's got the three brains. There's a green bit and a pink bit in the middle and then a blue bit underneath. Those are our three brains. The green bit on the outside, the crinkly walnut part, is the bit that we think with and we reason and we choose and we, you know, we do make moral and ethical um, decisions and we figure stuff out and we solve problems and, you know, all kinds of things. With it. But that's the outside of the brain. That A bit of that is our 5%. Everything else, the pink bit in the middle, that's our, that's our um, chemical, our limbic, our, our mammalian brain, our survival brain. It's got lots of different names depending on just how you're thinking about it. But that brain runs the autonomic nervous system. And then you've got the habit brain at the back of the head, which, which stores our really hardwired things, like breathing and walking and talking and eating and pooping and, you know, really basic stuff. We don't think about it because we've memorized a set of actions, a set of feelings. We don't just memorize actions, we memorize feelings too. And it gets, it gets memorized in the unconscious systems in our body and in our brain. So you think, oh, I've been feeling like crap for the last two years. I want to stop that now. And then you wonder why it's so hard. And that's why. Because with the 5% of your conscious mind, you're saying, I want to stop feeling like crap. And your body is saying, but you made me feel like crap for the last two years because something horrible happened to you and you got traumatized and you got stuck in that trauma and you couldn't overcome it. And now you just think and feel just continually like that same person is just having that same experience over and over again. Because every time you have the thought, you have the same feeling and it is like you're experiencing it all over again. I mean, in the, in the worst scenario, that's PTSD. That's what happens. People get stuck in these looped thoughts and the body is stuck in the chemistry that goes with the thoughts and they just can't get out of it. 95% is running the show. The 5% is just sitting in the middle of it going, oh my God, this is horrible and I can't stop it. That's, you know, that's what I've been, so that's what I've been explaining. It's like, how do we get there? Um, so, now that I've spent half my time, last week I talked about the inherited memories that we get with our genes and we do get some emotional um, and, and, and skill memories and all kinds of things we inherit from our parents because the best memories and best does not necessarily mean good but the most used the most referred to the ones that were most valuable to help our parents survive um, are, are the ones that we inherit because they get they get programmed in the cell right that they, they get expressed in the genes and the, the DNA remembers. And so the memory is passed on, not just to the daughter cells in our body when the cell divides, but if we have a child, the memories get passed on, some of them, in the genes that we give to our children. Not that I have a child, just in case anybody wonders. I chose not to. Um, oh, I'm glad you like the description, Mike. It's, um, you know, it's, it's taken me a long time to work this out. Um, for myself, right, to really describe it well for me, because if I can understand it, maybe other people can too. So, we inherit memories, but then what else happens? You know, it's the whole nature versus nurture, genes, genetics, nature. But what happens? You're not, enti you know, you can have a, a set of twin, an identical twins, they've got the same genes, and yet they grow up to be completely different people. So clearly it's not just about genes that make us who we are. Well, the first influence that happens is that once the, the genes from the mother and the genes from the father come together and you get a mixture of genes, right, that's your genetic inheritance, then you are inside your mother for nine months, give or take, you know, everyone's different. And there is actually a really complex dance that goes on between the genes that you have and what she is thinking and feeling and experiencing and choosing and what's going on in her world because there's this thing called environment and I've stayed away from the environment word all this time because I didn't want to have to define it and then I thought okay I can define it and there's enough other things that I've explained that 
I can talk about environment in a way that's hopefully going to make sense. So because most of the time when you say, well, what's the environment? People say, oh, it's Gaia, it's nature, it's the world, it's the, it's, it's the physical thing that's outside my door or out around me, right? But in terms of our body, our environment is actually the environment in which our cells live. That's the environment, and we actually control that by our thoughts and our feelings. Remember, you think a thought, you feel a feeling, and it can go the other way. But when you feel that feeling and you make chemistry, that goes into the bloodstream, and that is the environment in which your cells function. So you control the environment inside your body, which is a kind of an empowering but also a scary thought. Now here's the thing. Take a little baby and put it inside its mother's womb. There's a placenta. There's an umbilical cord. The baby is a chemical union with its mother. It's the same. So whatever the mother is experiencing, the baby's experiencing too, chemically. Not just in terms of, you know, the light that comes through the through the outside of the, you know, the, the, the mother's body and the sounds and all those other things. But the primarily, all that time, 24-7, the mother's chemical experience is the baby's chemical experience. So, and I do two examples, and I'm going to tell you about the two examples because this, I think, makes it make it makes it clearer. Um, let's say that you have you have inherited, like your father was a sad person, and your mother's a happy person, and so you've inherited sad. So when your mother and your father, the gene, the the you know the X and the Y, they came together. You happen to get the sad gene from your dad, right? It's there in your genetic makeup. But your mum is so excited that she's pregnant. She's really looking forward to you being born. And she spends the entire nine months feeling really well. She has an easy pregnancy. And she's just happy for nine months while you're inside her growing your little body. So in that time... Even though you have this gene, which is really, you know, it's sitting there because you got it from your dad, uh -huh. um, your mother, her chemistry is hitting your cells all the time. Happy, 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 happy. Do you think that your cells might be pretty good at behaving like happy cells by the time you're born? They will be. Even though you've got your father's sad gene, because he had some stuff go on in his life, you know, whatever, um... Your mother, who who the environment that she provided for you, without knowing, and, and all of our parents do the best they can with what they have, always, no matter how awful we think it is, they do that. They're doing the best they can because remember, they were kids once too. They were born a helpless, defenseless little baby, just like you and me, and they had to deal with whatever their life threw with them, threw at them. So, dad has a sad gene. But mum is happy for nine months, and so our cells get accustomed to happy chemistry. So that baby, and this is very, very simplified, but let's say that baby is going to be born, and they're going to be a happy, peaceful, contented little baby, and you know, and, and, and then that's cool. Imagine you have a mum and a dad, and they're both happy people. So you have a combination of happy genes, and that kid is probably going to inherit happy genes. Again, vast simplification, but it's probable. And then Baby's conceived, and then there is a tragedy in the family. Somebody very important to the mother dies. Just say that. And as a result of that, she's filled with grief. And as well, there are extra responsibilities and jobs and things that she has to take on. Whatever they are. And I'm purposefully being non-specific here. Just there's a tragedy, and as a result, her life changes. And she is now very sad, and she's also really stressed. Because the things that she now has to do um, are, are hard and she's not getting enough rest. And maybe there are financial implications of the tragedy that's happened and she can't get enough food or she's sick but she can't get treatment. But she spends nine months being stressed. So you have a genetic code where happy, happy, but for nine months, sad, 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 stress, 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 stress. So even though the genetic blueprint is there, there is this other influence of the mother's experience that can change how that blueprint is actually expressed. 
And so you could have a baby that is born and it's kind of fretful and, you know, and, and it's just always kind of gripey and upset and it can't settle and it can't relax. And you think, well, how? And again, it's very, very simple, very simplified. But just to explain that the chemical environment that we experience in utero is going to have an impact because it's the exact same impact that's going to happen if we keep thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking and thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking, and feeling and thinking all day long for our lives. It's just the first influence that isn't our genetic code and that's what I've been writing about this week is okay what's our operating system well we get the genetic code and then we have the influence of our mother's chemistry while we're inside her womb growing okay that can happen and this is not a reason I think I've already said it. this is not a reason to say oh well everything's my mother's fault no like I said our parents always do the best they can with what they have. What they have may be pretty shitty. And of course, we're not there to remember. We don't know. And when it's really shitty, often it's not talked about either. So Because they may have even forgotten because it was so horrible. So you just don't know what it is that your parents had to deal with when they were as small as you were when it was difficult for you. Um, and if your parents were happy people, what a blessing. You know, we, we just get a mix. Um, so the key thing about this is, is we're not trapped, we have genes, we have this influence from our mother, who of course is influenced from everything that's going on around her, the people and the places and the situations and the circumstances, and everything is happening, and that, I mean, that is just what happens, but to understand that that's nature, is our genes, and this is the first piece of nurture, the influence that changes how those genes express. And because I'm talking a lot about feelings, I use feeling examples. In fact, that this can make a difference to bodies and health as well. Um, so what have I missed? Yeah, the, the key point is our genetic memories are a starting point and they can be changed. And the thing is, okay, so if we've got programming, there's another word to put about it, to wrap around this, we could say, well, we've got a program because of what happened when we were inside the womb. Well, that programming can be changed because it's not like you get born and nothing happens, right? There are more experiences. And eventually we grow up and we can start making choices and learning more things and having more experiences. But remember, because I had to remind myself of this, the whole reason why I'm talking about this is because I'm talking about where does that 95% come from? And this is, these are the first two building blocks, genes uh, in utero experience. Once we're born, then I can start to talk about brain waves. Because when we get born, our brain isn't delta. We're asleep with our eyes open most of the time. We don't have, we're not, I've got our eyes open anyway. We're sleeping. That's why we're asleep. And then the brain speeds up and you have more experiences and more gets downloaded into the operating system. And then eventually your brain works enough that you start to make choices and things. But the 95% that first operating system that we get is happening before we get to make any choices and we have to know how to get into that operating system and change it. And that too is what God of me is about. But it helps to understand, I think, that this is how it works. This is what goes on. And, and you know, anybody who's pregnant thinking, oh my God, every thought I have, every feeling, well, yeah, 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 it's a fact of life. But hey, here's the thing. Don't stress about it. <laughs> I know that's not a great help. But the point is, that's going to happen. You're human. Me too. Um, the key thing is, if you can just pay attention, and by the way, this is how change happens. You, The first thing you have to do to change is to, is, is to actually pay attention and just notice what you are thinking. Really, I mean really, sit down and pay attention. Sit still with yourself for 10 minutes. Don't pick up your phone. Don't listen to music. Just five minutes. And notice what thoughts are going through your head when you have no distractions. It can be a bit scary. It can be a bit painful. It can be a bit, oh my God, I have no idea. But, you know, if it's your unborn baby or if it's you, you know, the rest of us aren't pregnant, but we're still thinking and feeling and programming ourselves. What do we want to be telling ourselves? So 
that's what I've been writing about. <laughs> it is, you know, it's it's it, it's a level of detail that I suppose I didn't I didn't know if I'd need to go into. But if I'm gonna explain it properly, this this is the first influence is that nine months, and after that. It continues. So that's what I'll be writing about next week. Thank you so much for joining in with me. I do appreciate your attention and your participation. I love your comments. And if you're on YouTube, thank you for watching. Thank you for liking and sharing and subscribing. Every single thing that you do to support me and my husband and this God of Me project is appreciated. So much love and I'll see you next week with another update. Until then, bye-bye.